Okay, hi everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine, and this is Jake Applebaum, and we're here to tell you more about what's going on with Tor over the past year. We actually wanted to start out uh, asking Laura to give us a little bit of context from her perspective about Citizen Four and the value of these sorts of tools to journalists. Um, so, my life? Okay. Um, so, um, Roger and Jake asked me to say a few things about, about Tor and what does it mean for investigative journalists. And I can say that certainly the work that I've done on w working with um, the disclosures by Edward Snowden and first communicating him with him would not have been possible without the work that, that these two people do and that everybody who, who contributes to the Tor network. So, I'm deeply grateful to everyone here. Um, when I was communicating with Snowden for several months before um, before I met him in Hong Kong, we talked often about um, uh, the Tor network, and it's something that actually he feels is vital for you know online privacy and uh, to sort of defeat surveillance. It's really our only tool to be able to do that. Um, and I just wanted to tell one story about what happens when journalists don't use it. Um, I can't go into lots of details, but there's a, a very well-known investigative journalist who was working on a story. He had a source, and the source was in the intelligence community. Um, and he had done some research on his computer not using Tor. Mm -hmm. And I was with him, and he got a phone call. And he, on the phone, the person was saying, what the fuck were you doing looking up this, this, and this? And this is an example of what happens when intelligence agencies target journalists. So without Tor, we literally can't do the work that we need to do. So thank you, and please support Tor. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> so to follow up on what Laura has just said, um, we, we think it's important to really expand not just into the technical world or to talk about it, political issues in some abstract sense, but also to reach out to culture. So in this case, this is a picture in the Reina Sofia, which is one of the largest museums in Spain, and that in the middle is Mason Judy and Trevor Paglin, and that's me on the right and uh, the only time you'll ever find me on the right. And so it is the case that this is a Tor relay. It's actually two Tor relays running on the open hardware device Novena made by Bunny and Sean. And it's actually running as a middle relay now, but it may in some point with one configuration change become an exit relay. And it is the case that the Reina Sofia is hosting this Tor relay. So now if, so we live in capitalism. <clears throat> So, so it is the case that if the police want to seize this relay, they've got to buy it like every other piece of art in the museum. And part of the reason that we're doing this kind of stuff, or at least that piece of art, which I, I did with Trevor and Mason and Leif Riggi, who's also in this room, and Aaron Gibson, also in this room, um, is because we think that culture is important. And we think that it's important to tie the issue of anonymity not just as an abstract idea, but as an actual thing that is representative not only of our culture, but of the world we want to live in overall for all the cultures of the world. And so for that reason, we also have quite recently been thinking a lot about social norms. And it is the case that there is a person in our community and many persons in our community that have come under attack and have been deeply harassed. And we, we think that that sucks and we don't like that. Even though we promote anonymity without any question, that is no back doors ever, and we'll get back to that in a minute, it is the case that we really want to promote being excellent to each other in the sort of spirit of noise bridge. <clears throat> Next slide. And this is a little bit American-centric, but you can get the basic idea. It applies to Europe as well. Just replace First Amendment with some your local law or a local constitutional right. It isn't the case that we're saying that you shouldn't have the right to say things, but we are saying get the fuck out of our community if you're going to be abusive to women. <clears throat> you'll note that I use the word fuck to say it. And I'm sorry about that. Because the point is, we all make mistakes. And we want to make sure that, well, it's true that we have transgressions. We want to make sure that we can find a place of reconciliation and we can work towards conflict resolution. 
And it's important at the same time to recognize that there are people whose real lives are harmed by harassment online. In this case, one of the people is in this audience, and I hope that they won't mind being named, but we want to give her a shout out and say that we stand behind her 100%. Yeah, so... Yep. So one of our developers on Core Tour, Andrea, has been harassed on Twitter and elsewhere uh, really a lot more than should happen to anybody. And there are a couple of points to make here. One of them is she's a woman and women online have been harassed for basically since online has existed. Uh, not just women, other minorities uh, pretty much all over the place. Uh, especially recently, uh, things have been getting worse. The other important point to realize uh, She's not just being attacked because she happens to be there. She's being attacked because they're trying to attack the Tor project and all the other people in Tor. So yes, she may be the focus of some of the attacks, but we, the rest of the Tor community, the rest of the security community, need to stand up and take on some of this burden of communicating and interacting and talking about these issues. Uh, we can't just leave it to her to defend herself. And so we want to set a particular standard, which is that there are lots of journalists that have a lot of questions, and we really think that there are a lot of legitimate questions to ask. For example, I think it sucks that we take Department of Defense money sometimes. And sometimes I also think it's good that people have the ability to feed themselves and have the ability to actually have a home and a family. Now, I don't have those things, really. I mean, I can feed myself, but I don't have a home or a family in the same way that, say, the family people inside of Tor do. And they need to be paid. It is the case that that is true, and that raises questions. Like, I, I personally wouldn't ever take CIA money, and I think that nobody should. I don't think the CIA should exist. But we have a diversity. <clears throat> we have a diversity of funding because we have a diversity of users. And so that raises a lot of questions, and I think people should ask those questions, and Roger and the rest of the Tor community feels that way too. But it's important that we don't single out a specific person, and in particular, to single out Andrea again, she does not deserve all of the heat about some of the decisions that the Tor project as a nonprofit makes. She is a developer who is integral to Tor. If it was not for her, a significant portion of Tor would not exist. It would not be as bug-free as it is, and it would not be getting better all the time. So we want people to reach out to this alias if they actually want to talk and have a forum where the whole of Tor can really respond and think about these things in a positive way and really engage with the press in a way that we can manage. Because at the moment we get, I would say, five on average press requests every day. That's really a lot. And it is also the case that four of those requests are very well phrased, extremely reasonable questions. And one of them is, you know, why did Jews run Tor? And we should address all of them. We really should. And at the same time, we have to recognize that some of these people that are kind of harassing, they might trigger me. That one would trigger me, and I would probably write back with something kind of shitty. So we want to distribute the work in a way where people will be nice, even to the people that are unreasonable. Because at the core, we need to be held to account, and we need people to look to us about these things and to ask us these hard questions. And so this is the address to reach out to, not harassing Andrea online on Twitter, not coming after individual developers, not posting crazy stuff on the mailing list. Wait until we've actually talked here, then post the crazy stuff on the mailing list or wherever you're going to post it, and then hopefully we can actually answer the questions in a good faith, helpful way. There's no reason to talk about conspiracy theories. We can just talk about the business plans. And then to that point, we want to make it clear, stop being an asshole to people in the community, but this is not negotiable. We are not saying, because we don't want you to harass people, that we're going to backdoor tour. That will never happen. You will find a bullet in the back of my head before that happens, and maybe Rogers too, depending on the order of operations. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the various things we've done over the past year uh, to give you a very brief introduction to Tor. Tor is an anonymity system. Uh, you've got Alice, the client over there. She builds a path through three different relays around the world. And the idea is that somebody watching her local network connection can't figure out what destination she's going to. And somebody watching the destinations can't figure out where she's coming from. And we have quite a few relays at this point. Uh, here's a, the red line. Is is the graph of the number of relays we've had over the past year. For those of you who remember Heartbleed, you can see the big drop in April when we removed a bunch of relays that had insecure keys. But this is not the interesting graph. The interesting graph is capacity over the past year. And we've gone from a little over 6 gigabytes per second of capacity up to more than 12 gigabytes per second of capacity. And as long as we can make the difference between those two lines big enough, then Tor performance is pretty good. But we rely on all of you to keep on running relays and make them faster and so on, so that we can handle all the users who need Tor. OK, another topic, um, deterministic builds. Mike Perry and Seth Schoen did a great talk a few days ago, so you should go watch the stream on that. The very short version is uh, we have a way of building Tor Browser so that everybody can build Tor Browser and produce the same binary, and that way you don't have to worry about problems on your build machine, and you can actually check that the program we give you really is based on the source code uh, that we say that it is. And this is, of course, important because we really don't want to be a focal point where someone comes after us and says, you have to produce a backdoored version. So it's very important because we do receive a lot of pressure from a lot of different groups, and we never want to cave. And here's how we think it is the case that we will never cave. Free software, open specifications, reproducible builds, things that can be verified with cryptographic signatures. That will not only keep us honest against the, what do you call it, the angels of our better nature. I don't believe in angels. But anyway, the point is that it will keep us honest, but it will also keep other people at bay from trying to do something harmful to us. Because when something happens, you will be able to immediately find it. And Mike Perry, by the way, is incredible. He probably hates that I'm saying his name right now. Sorry, Mike. Are you here? <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> But Mike Perry is a machine. I mean, he, he also has a heart, but he's a machine, and he's incredible. And he has been working nonstop on this, and he is really groundbreaking in not only doing this for Firefox, but really thinking about these hard problems and understanding that if he was just building this browser by himself and he was doing it in a non-verifiable way, um, that it would really actually be a serious problem because we distribute this software. And so, I mean, there is a reason that the NSA calls Mike Perry a worthy adversary. And it is because he's amazing. So let's give it up for Mike Perry. Not only that, but his work, along with Bitcoin's work, has pushed Debian and Fedora and other groups to work on reproducible builds as well. So hopefully the whole security community will get better. And to the point about Citizen 4, one of the things that's been happening quite recently is that uh, really respectable, nice people like the people at Mozilla have decided that they really want us to work together, which is great because we've wanted to and we have respected their work for a very long time. And so Tor is now partnering with Mozilla, and that means that Mozilla as a group will be running Tor relays, at first middle nodes, and then hopefully, we believe, exit relays. And that is huge because Mozilla is at the forefront of doing a lot of work for end users, just everyday, regular people wanting privacy. Things like do not track, for example, are a way to try to experiment. Things like the Tor browser are a way to experiment even further to really bring privacy by design. And it's amazing that Mozilla is doing that. And we've made a partnership with them, and we are hopeful cautiously optimistic even, that this is going to produce some very good results where our communities can sort of fuse and give privacy by design software to every person on the planet with no exceptions whatsoever. Now, 
We also have a couple of things that we would like to talk about just generally that are a little bit technical, but at the same time we want to keep it accessible because we think that this talk, well, it's useful to talk about technical details. The most important thing is someone who's never heard of the Tor community before who watches this video, we want them to understand some of the details and enough, let's say, technical understanding that they'll be able to go and look it up if they want to, but they'll also understand we're not just glossing over it completely. So pluggable transports are very important. Right now, the way that Tor works is that we connect with an SSL TLS connection, the protocol SSL TLS, one of the two, depending on the client library and the server library. And that looks like an SSL connection for the most part. But as some of you know, there are people on this planet that connect SSL, uh, collect SSL and TLS data about everything flowing across the internet. That's really a problem. It turns out we thought in some cases that it was just censorship that mattered, but it turns out broad classification of traffic is really actually a problem, not just for blocking, but also for later doing identification of traffic flows. So I've already lost the non-technical people in the audience, so let me rephrase that and say, we have these other ways of connecting to the Tor network, and they don't look just like a secure banking transaction. They look instead like DNS or HTTP, that is your regular web browsing or name resolution. And we have a lot of different pluggable transports, and some of them are cool. Some of them make it look like you're connecting to Google, when in fact you're connecting to the Tor project. And it's because you in fact are connecting to Google. Um, Leaf Riggi, are you in the room? Here? Maybe? No? This is really, uh, you guys, in your anonymity. So, uh, <laughs> it, it is the case, he, he showed this to me, I mentioned this to some other people, and David Fifield, I think, either independently rediscovered it. Uh, there's also the Go agent people that discovered this. You can connect to Google with an SSL connection, and the certificate will say www.google.com, and you, of course, verify it, and it is, of course, signed probably by Adam Langley personally, and Maybe it's just the Google CAs. And um, then you give it a different HTTP host header. So you say, actually, I want to talk to AppSpot. I want to talk to torbridge.appspot.com. And inside of the TLS connection, which looks like it's a connection to Google, which is one of the most popular websites on the internet, you then make a, essentially an encrypted connection through that. And then from there to the Tor network. Using Google, but also Cloudflare. They don't just provide you with captures. <laughs> Poor Cloudflare guy. We were, we were joking we should stand outside his office and make him answer CAPTCHAs to get in the door. <laughs> All of those people clapping wish you would solve the Cloudflare CAPTCHA issue. So it also works with other compute clusters and other CDNs. And so this is really awesome because it means that now you can connect through those CDNs to the Tor network using Meek and other pluggable transports like that. Um, so that's a huge win. And deploying it by default, I think we have another slide for that. Nope, that's it. We've got a different one, yes. Yeah. Uh, so one of the neat things about Meek is uh, because it works on all these different sorts of providers, Akamai and all the CDNs out there, uh, a lot of those are still reachable from places like China. Lots of our uh, pluggable transports don't work so well in China, but Meek does at this point, so there are a lot of happy users. Here's an, a, a graph of an earlier pluggable transport that we had called Obfus 3. It still works in China and Iran and Syria and lots of places around the world. But the sort of blue aqua line uh, is how much use we've seen of Obfus 3. And you can tell exactly when we put out the new Tor browser release that had Obfus 3 built in and easy to use by ordinary people. So one of the really important pushes we've been doing is trying to make, uh, rather than trying to explain how pluggable transports work and teach you everything, just make them really simple. Make them part of Tor browser. You just click on my Tor isn't working, so I want to use uh, some other way to make my Tor work. Uh, and we've got 10,000 people at this point who are happily using Obvious 3. I think a lot of them are in Syria and Iran at this point.
Something else we've been doing over the past year is working really hard on improving the robustness and uh, testing infrastructure and unit tests for the core Tor source code. So Nick Mathewson and Andrea Shepard in particular have been really working on robustness to make this uh, something that we can rely on as a building block in Tails, in Tor browser, in all the other applications that rely on Tor. So in the background, things are getting a lot stronger. Hopefully that that will serve us very well in the battles to come. Okay. So this fine gentleman, who was a teen heartthrob on Italian television many years ago. Thank you for doxing me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, only you'd been using Tor. <laughs> yeah, TV over Tor. So, um, a project that uh, we started uh, a couple of years ago with, uh, with Jake um, is uh, sort of related, I guess, to uh, the Tor project's goals of uh, increasing privacy and uh, having a better uh, understanding on how uh, uh, people's lives are impacted through technology. And uh, this, uh, this project is called uh, UNI, or the Open Observatory of Network Interference. Uh, and what it is before being a piece of software is a set of principles uh, and best practices and specifications written in English uh, for how it is uh, best to conduct uh, network-related measurements. Uh, the sort of measurements that we're interested in uh, running have to do with identifying uh, network irregularities. Uh, these are symptoms uh, then can uh, be uh, the sign of presence of surveillance or censorship uh, on uh, the network that you are testing. Um, and we use uh, a methodology that has been peer-reviewed, uh, which, of which we have published a paper. Uh, it's implemented using uh, free software, uh, and all of the data that we collect uh, is made available to the public, so that you can uh, look at it, analyze it, and uh, draw your uh, own conclusions from it. Um, and, and so we believe that this effort is something that is uh, uh, helpful and useful to people such as uh, journalists, researchers, activists, or just simple citizens that are interested in uh, being more aware and uh, have a better understanding that is based on facts instead of uh, uh, just anecdotes uh, on what is the reality of uh, internet censorship in their country. Uh, and we believe that historical data is especially important because it gives us uh, an understanding of how the, these uh, uh, censorship and surveillance apparatuses evolve over time. Um, so I, I would like to invite uh, you all to uh, run Uniprobe today. Uh, if you um, copy and paste uh, this uh, uh, command line inside of uh, um, a Debian-based system, obviously, perhaps you should read what is inside it before running it. Uh, but, but once you do that, you will have uh, Uniprobe set up and you will be collecting measurements uh, for your country. Uh, if instead you would like to have uh, um, an actual hardware device. We, we have uh, uh, a very limited number of them, uh, but if, uh, if you're from an interesting country and you're interested in running Uniprobe, uh, we can give you a little Raspberry Pi with an LCD screen that you can take home, connect to the, your network, uh, and, uh, and, and adopt an Uniprobe uh, in, uh, in your home network. Uh, to learn more about this, you should uh, uh, come later today uh, in, um, at Noisy Square uh, at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, to learn uh, more about it. Thank you. <clears throat> and just, just to finish up here, I mean, UNI, UNI is a human rights observation project, which Arturo and Aaron Gibson, also somewhere in the room, I'm sure he won't stand up, so I won't even ask him this. Um, it's great. Because we went from a world where there was no open measurement with only secret tools, essentially, where people acted like secret agents going into countries to do measurements. There wasn't really an understanding of the risks that were involved, how the tests functioned, where non-technical people could have reasonable explanations. And now we have open measurement tools, we have open data standards, we have really like a framework for understanding this as a human right, to observe the world around you, and then also to share that data and to actually discuss that data, what it means, and to be able to set standards for it. And hopefully that means that people have informed consent when they engage in something that could be risky, like running uni in a place like it's dangerous, like the United States or Cuba or something like China. And so... <clears throat> 
Arturo, personally, though, is the, is the heart and soul of Uni. And it is really important that we see that the Tor community is huge. It's really huge. It's made up of a lot of people doing a lot of different things. And part of Uni is Tor. We need Tor to be able to have a secure communications channel back to another system. We need that so that people can log into these Uni probes, for example, over Tor hidden services. That kind of uh, fusion of things where we have anonymity, but at the same time we have this data set that is in some cases identifying, some cases it's not identifying, depending on the test. We need that anonymous communications channel to do that kind of human rights observation. And so just so we can make Arturo a little, uh, feel a little appreciated, I just want to give him another round of applause for making this human rights observation project. So I encourage all of you not only to run Uniprobe in interesting places and in boring places because they might become interesting, but also to help write new tests and work on the design of these things so that we can uh, detect and notice new problems on the internet uh, more quickly. Something else we've been up to over the past year is Tor Weekly News. We were really excited by Linux Weekly News and, and so on, and uh, so every week there's a new blog post and mail that summarizes what's happened over the past week. We encourage you to look at all of these. Uh, a special shout out to Harmony and Lunar for helping to make this happen over the past year. Thank you. Yeah. Finally, there's a Tor list you can be on that you really want to be on. Being on list is good. One <laughs> of the other features we've been uh, really excited about over the past year, uh, EFF has been helping with outreach. EFF ran a Tor uh, relay challenge to try to get a lot of people running relays, and I think they have uh, several thousand relays that signed up because of the relay challenge, pushing a lot of traffic, so that's really great. Yeah. And at the same time, not only did they get a lot of more people running relays, but they also did some great advocacy and outreach for getting more exit relays at universities and basically teaching people why Tor is important. We all need to be doing more of that. We'll touch on that a little bit more later. So you all, I hope, remember what was going on in Turkey earlier this year. Here's a cool graph of Tor use in Turkey when they started to block YouTube and other things, then people realized I need to get some tool to get around that censorship. Uh, but you probably weren't paying attention when Iraq filtered Facebook and suddenly a lot of people in Iraq needed to get some sort of way to get around their censorship. So there are a bunch of interesting graphs like this on the Tor metrics project uh, of what's been going on over the past year. And we actually, um, if you could go back, yeah, all right. It, one thing that's really interesting about this is that Carson Losing, who is, I think, uh, not, also not going to stand up. Maybe you will. Are you here? I don't see you. Carson? No? Okay. Well, he does all the metrics, um, this anonymous, shadowy metrics figure. And if you go to metrics.torproject.org, you'll see open data that is properly anonymized. You would expect that from us, as well as actual documents that explain the anonymity, the counting techniques, that explain the privacy preserving statistics. And you can see these graphs, you can generate them based on certain parameters. If you are interested in seeing, for example, geopolitical events and how they tie into the internet, this, this project is part of what inspired UNI. This is how we get statistics and interesting things about the Tor network itself, from Tor clients, from Tor relays, from Tor bridges, and it tells you all sorts of things, platform information, version number of the software, what country someone, but not which someone, might be connecting from, and so on, where they're hosted. If you are interested, looking at this website and finding spikes like this, you may, in fact, be able to find out that there is a censorship event in that country, and we haven't noticed it. There are a lot of countries in the world if we split it up by country, and sometimes 50,000 Tor users fall off the Tor network because another American company has sold that country censorship equipment. We need help finding these events and then understanding their context. So if in your country something like that happens, Looking at this data can help us not only to advocate for anonymity in such a place, but it can help us to also technically realize we need to fix a thing, change a thing, and it's through this data that we can have a dialogue about those things. So if you have no technical ability at all, but you're interested and understand where you come from, look at this data set, try to understand it, and then reach out to us, and hopefully we can learn about it. That's how we learned about this, that's how we learned about the previous thing, and many years ago we gave a Tor talk about how countries and governments and corporations try to censor Tor. And of course, a lot has happened since then. 
There's a lot of those things, and it's very difficult to keep up with them. So we really need the community's help to contextualize, to explain, and define these things. Okay, next section of the talk. Uh, things that excited journalists over the past year that actually turned out to be not so big a deal. And we're gonna try to blow through a lot of them quickly so that we can get to the stuff that actually was a big deal. So. Uh, I guess in August or something, uh, there was going to be a Black Hat talk about how you can just totally break Tor, and then the Black Hat talk got pulled. Uh, it turns out that it was a group at CMU who were doing some research on Tor, um, and I, I begged them for a long time to get a little bit of information about what attack they had. Eventually, they sent me uh, a little bit of information, and then we were thinking about how to fix it, and then Nick Mathewson, one of the Tor developers, said, why don't I just deploy a, a detection thing on the real Tor network, just in case somebody is doing this? And then it turns out somebody was doing this. And then I sent mail to the CERT people saying, hey, are you like, are you like running those 100 relays that are doing this attack on Tor users right now? And I never heard back from them after that. So that's sort of a, there, that this is a sad story for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but I guess the good news is we identified the relays that were doing the attack, we cut them out of the network, and we deployed a defense that will, first of all, make that particular attack not work anymore, and also detect it when somebody else is trying to do an attack like this. This, of course, is... This is, a, this is a hard lesson for two reasons, but the, the first reason is that that is awful to do those kinds of attacks on the real Tor network, and there's a question about responsibility. But the second lesson is that when these kinds of things happen and we have the ability to actually understand them, we can respond to them. Um, it's really awful that the talk was pulled, and it is really awful that these people were not able to give us more information, and it's also really awful that they were apparently carrying out the attack. And there are lots of open questions about it, but in general, we believe that we've mitigated the attack, which is important, but we also advocated for that talk to go forward because we think that, of course, the answer to even really frustrating speech is more speech, so we want to know more about it. Um, it somehow is very disturbing that that talk was pulled. And they should be able to present their research. Even if there's egg on our face, it's important for our users to know as much as we can so that we can move forward with protecting Tor users. Okay, so another exciting topic uh, from a couple of months ago. Uh, Russia apparently put out a call for research work to come up with attacks on Tor. And it's another attack on Tor. Enjoy your water, Jake. I hope that was worth it. <laughs> it was really worth it, so I'm very thirsty. So, Russia put out a call for research proposals on attacking Tor. Somebody mistranslated that phrase from Russian into prize or bounty or contest. And then we had all of these articles saying, Russia is holding a contest to break Tor, when actually, no, they just wanted somebody to work on research on Tor attacks. So this would be like the U.S. National Science Foundation holds a contest for Tor research. That's not actually how government funding works. Mistranslations cause a lot of exciting journalist articles, but um, as far as I can tell, uh, it turned out to be basically nothing. Also, it was basically no money, so maybe something will come of this, we'll see. Something else that's been bothering me a lot lately, Crypto wall, now called Crypto Locker. So there are jerks out there who break into your mobile phone of some sort, give you malware, viruses, something like that. They encrypt your files, and then they send you basically a ransom note saying, we've encrypted your file. If you want it back, send some Bitcoin over here. So this is, this is bad so far. But then the part that really upsets me is they say, and if you don't know how to do this, go to our website, torproject.org, and download the Tor browser in order to pay us. Fuck them. I do not want people doing this with our software. Yeah, fuck them. I mean, I don't really have a lot to contribute to that. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, hidden services have a really bad rap, and it's frustrating, right? There's, a, of course, there's quantitative and qualitative analysis that we can have here. And the reality of the situation is that one global leaks leaking interface is one dot onion, for example. What is the value of that versus 
10,000 hidden services run by these jerks. I mean, it's very hard to understand the social value of these things, except to say that we really need things like hidden services, and jackasses like this are really making it hard for us to defend the right to publish anonymously. And so if you know who these people are, please ask them to stop. I don't even know what the, the ask is there, but they're re they really should stop. Or maybe there's some interesting things that you can do. I don't know. But we really, really don't like that this is someone's first introduction to Tor, is that they think that we're responsible for this. We most certainly are not responsible for these things. We certainly do not deploy malware. And hidden services are actually very important for a lot of people. These people are not those people. Another exciting story a month or two ago was 81% of Tor users can be de-anonymized, uh, and then some more words depending on which article you read. So it turns out that uh, one of our friends, Sam Budo, who's a professor in India now, uh, did some work on uh, analyzing traffic correlation attacks in the lab. He found in the lab that some of his attacks worked sometime great, and then some journalist found it and said, ah, this must be the reason why uh, Tor is insecure today. So he wrote an article, it got slash dotted, it got all the other uh, news stories, and suddenly everybody knew that Tor was broken because 81% of Tor users. So it turns out that Sam Budo himself stood up and said, actually, no, you misunderstood my article. Uh, but that didn't matter because nobody listened to the author of the paper at that point. So I guess there's, there's a broader issue that uh, we're struggling with here in terms of uh, how to explain the details of these things. Because traffic correlation attacks are a big deal. They probably do work if you, uh, if you have enough traffic around the internet and you're looking at the right places. You probably can do the attack, but that paper did not do the attack. So I keep finding myself saying, no, 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 you're misunderstanding the paper. The paper doesn't tell us anything, but the attack is real, but the paper doesn't tell us anything. And this is really confusing to journalists because it sounds like I'm uh, disagreeing with myself with these two different sentences. So we need to come up with some way to, uh, to be able to explain, here are all of the real attacks that are really actually worrisome, and it's great that researchers are working on them, and they probably are a big deal in some way, but know that paper that you're pointing at right now uh, is not the reason why they're a big deal. We also saw this in the context of an NSA paper, which was published a couple of days ago, thanks to some other folks. Um, and yes, some other folks. Some other folks. <laughs> I won't specify exactly which uh, other folks. Yeah. And they similarly had a traffic correlation attack. And in the paper, it's really a bad one. It's, uh, it's the same as a paper that was published in 2003 in the open literature. There was a much better paper published in 2004 in the open literature that apparently these folks didn't read. So I don't want to say traffic correlation attacks don't work, but all these papers that we're looking at don't show, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't very good papers. Yeah, so one of the solutions to a lot of journalists don't understand technology is that it's actually quite easy to be a journalist by comparison to being a technologist. Um, it, it's possible to write about things in a factually correct way. Sometimes you don't always reach the right audiences. It, that can actually be difficult. It uh, depends. So you have to write for different reading comprehension levels, for example. And we try to write for people who understand the internet, at least when I write as a journalist. And so when I sometimes take off my tour hat, I put on my journalistic hat. And part of the reason is that in order to even tell you about some of the things that we learn, if I don't put on my journalistic hat, I get a nice pair of handcuffs. So it's very important to have journalistic protection so that we can inform you about these things. So for example, it is the case that X key score rules, um, we published some of them, not we tour, but me and this set of people at the top uh, of this uh, byline here, in NDR. Some of you know NDR, it's a, a very large German publication. I also published with Der Spiegel as a journalist. In this case, we published X key score rules where we specifically learned an important lesson. And the important lesson was even if you are a journalist explaining things exactly technically correctly, people will still get it wrong. It's just not the journalists that get it wrong, it's the readers. Very frustrating. People decided that because the NSA definitely has X key score rules, that is, rules for surveilling the internet where they're looking at big traffic buffers, Tempora, for example, the British surveillance system, that is built on X key score with a probably week long buffer of all internet traffic. That's a big buffer, by the way. 
Um, doing these X key score rules, running the, across that traffic set, they would find that people were connecting to directory authorities. One of those directory authorities is mine, actually, quite ironically, and then Sebastian Hahn and other people in this audience. Um, and so people said, oh, don't use Tor because the NSA will be monitoring you. That is exactly the wrong takeaway because there are X key score rules on the order of tens of thousands from what we can tell. So everything you do is going through these giant surveillance systems. And what you learn when you monitor someone using Tor is that they're using Tor potentially in that buffer, which is different than they learn for sure that you were going to the Chaos Computer Club's website or that you were going to a dating site. So it's the difference between they learn some teeny bit of information about you that you're using an anonymity system versus they learned exactly what you were doing on the internet. Now, if there were only a few X key score rules at all, and it was just that about Tor, then that conclusion people reach would be correct. But it's exactly not true. The X key score system is so powerful that if you have a logo for a company, so anyone here that runs a company and you put a logo inside of a document, the X key score system can find that logo in all the documents flowing across the internet in real time and alert someone that someone has sent a .doc or a PDF with that image inside of it and alert them so that they can intercept it. So the lesson is not don't use Tor because X key score may put your metadata into a database in the so-called corporate repositories. The lesson is, holy shit, there's this gigantic buffering system which has search capabilities that even allow you to search inside of documents really, really advanced capabilities where they can select that traffic and put it somewhere else. Use an anonymity system. And also, look, they're targeting anonymity systems, even in the United States, which, at least for the NSA, they're not supposed to be doing those kinds of things. They literally were caught lying here. They're doing bulk internet surveillance, even in the United States, using these kinds of systems. That's really scary, but the real big lesson to take away from that is actually that they're doing this for all the protocols that they can write fingerprints for, and they have generic languages where they can, or a generic language where they can actually describe protocols. And so we published a number of those, we NDR, and I would really recommend you read and understand that. But the lesson again is not, oh no, they're going to detect you're using Tor. We've never said that Tor can, for example, protect you against someone seeing that you're using it, especially in the long term, but rather the point is, exactly the scariest point. This mass internet surveillance is real, and it is the case that it is real time, and it's a real problem. If you're using Tor, they see that you're using Tor. If you're not using Tor, they see exactly where you're going. You end up in the list of people who went to this website or this website or used this service or sent this document. Uh, and the diversity of Tor users is part of the safety where just because they know you're using Tor doesn't tell them that much. One of the other things I've been wrestling with after looking at a bunch of these documents lately is the whole how do we protect against pervasive surveillance. And this is an entire talk on its own. Uh, we've been doing some design changes. We've pushed out some changes in Tor that uh, protect you more against uh, pervasive surveillance. We've, for the technical people out there, we've reduced the number of guard relays that you use by default from three to one. So there are fewer places on the internet that get to see your tour traffic. That's a good start. One of the other lessons we've been realizing, the internet is more centralized than we'd like. So it's easy to say, oh, we just need more exit relays, and then we'll have more protection against these things. But if we put another exit relay in that same data center in Frankfurt that they're already watching, that's not actually going to give us more safety against these pervasive surveillance adversaries. Something else I realized, uh, so we used to talk about how Tor does these two different things. We've got anonymity, we're trying to protect against somebody trying to, to learn what you're doing, and we've got circumvention, censorship circumvention, we're trying to protect against somebody trying to prevent you from going somewhere. But it turns out, in the surveillance case, they do deep packet inspection to figure out what protocol you're doing to find out what you're up to. And in the censorship case, they do deep packet inspection to figure out what protocol you're using to decide whether to block it. So it's actually these fields are much more related than we had realized before. And 
It took us a while. I'm really happy that we have these documents to look at so that we have a better understanding of how uh, this global surveillance and censorship works. Um, long ago, so in 2007, I ended up doing a talk at the NSA to try to convince them that we were not the bad guys. Uh, and you can read the notes that they took about my talk at the NSA because they're published in the Washington Post. So I encourage you to go read what the NSA thought of my talk to them. Uh, that same year, I ended up going to GCHQ to give a talk to them, to try to convince them that we were not the bad people. And I thought to myself, I don't want to give them anything useful. I don't want to talk about anonymity because I know they're going to try to break anonymity. So I'm going to give them a talk that has nothing to do with anything that they should care about. I'm going to talk about the censorship arms race in China and DPI and stuff like that that they shouldn't care about at all. Boy, were we wrong. So the other thing to think about here, um, there are a bunch of different pluggable transports that could come in handy against the surveillance adversary. We have so far been thinking of pluggable transports in terms of there's somebody trying to censor your connection, they're doing DPI, or they're looking for addresses and they're trying to block things. Uh, one of the things we learned from this past summer's documents, imagine an adversary who builds a list of all the public tour relays. And then they build a list of all the IP addresses that connect to those Tor relays. Now they know all the bridges and many of the users. And now they build a list of all the IP addresses that connect to those IP addresses. And they go a few hops out. And now they know all the public relays, all the bridges, all the users, all the other things that are connected to Tor. And they can keep track of which ones they should uh, log traffic for for the next six months rather than the next the next week. Uh, that's a really scary adversary. Some of the pluggable transports we've been working on could actually come in handy here. So flash proxy is one of the ones uh, you heard about in last year's talk. The basic idea for flash proxy is to get users running web browsers to volunteer uh, running WebRTC or something like that uh, to basically be a short-lived bridge between the censored user and the Tor network. So the idea is that you get millions of people running browsers and then you can proxy from inside China or Syria or America or wherever the problem is through the browser into the Tor network. But from the surveillance perspective, suddenly they end up with an enormous list of millions of people around the world that are basically buffering the Tor user from the Tor network. So if they start with this list of IP addresses and they're trying to build a list of everything, now they end up with millions of IP addresses that have nothing to do with Tor. And they have to realize at the time they're watching that they want to go one more hop out. So I don't know if that will work, but this is an interesting research area that more people need to look at. How can we, against an adversary who's trying to build a list of everybody who has anything to do with Tor, how can we have Tor users not end up on that list? What sort of transports or uh, tunneling through Google App Spot or other tools like that can we use to break that chain so it's not as easy for them to track down where all the users are? Okay, Silk Road 2. We've had a lot of questions about, I think it's called Operation Onimus. Uh, I actually talked to an American law enforcement person who was involved in this, and he told me, um, from his perspective, exactly how it happened. Uh, apparently, the Silk Road 2 guy wrote his name down somewhere, so they brought him in and started asking him questions. And as soon as they started asking him questions, he started naming names. And they counted up to 16 names, and they went and arrested all those people and collected their computers. And then they put out a press release saying that they had an amazing Tor attack. So there are a couple of lessons here. Uh, one of them is, yes, it's another case where OPSEC failed. Uh, but the other lesson that we learned is these large law enforcement adversaries are happy to use press spin and lies and whatever else it takes to try to scare people away from having safety on the internet. This is a really, to me, especially if I take off my Tor hats and put on my journalistic hat as if I can actually take off hats and so on, but it's really terrifying that journalists don't actually ask hard questions about that. You know, the... The Europol P2 
people that spoke to the press, they talked about this as if they had some incredible attack. They talked about O'Day. They talked about how uh, you know they had broken Tor. You're not safe on the dark web. We don't even use the term dark web. That's how you know that they're full of shit. But it's it's. That's sort of like when people have Tor in all caps. Tor in all caps, dark web, that kind of stuff. It's just a bad sign. But the way they talked about it, it was clear that they, as far as we can tell, they don't have that. But they really hyped it as much as they possibly could. I mean, it is effectively, and I think it is even technically, a psychological operation against the civilian population. They want to scare you into believing that Tor doesn't work because, in fact, it does work and it is a problem for them. So anytime they can ever have some kind of win at all, they always spin it as if they're great, powerful adversaries and it's us versus them. And that's exactly wrong. It is not us versus them because we all need anonymity. We all absolutely need that and they shouldn't be treating us as adversaries. They, in fact, are also Tor users, quite ironically. So it is interesting, though, because they know that they haven't done that, but they don't want you to know that they haven't done that. In fact, they want you to know the opposite. Now, of course, we could be wrong. They could have some super secret exploit, but as far as we can tell, that just is not the case. So what's to be learned from this? We used to think it was just American law enforcement that were scary jerks. Now it's also European. I don't know if that's the right lesson. But hopefully, some of you will go and work at Europol and tell us what's really going on. Speaking of hidden services, we have a new design in mind that will have some stronger crypto properties and make it harder to enumerate hidden services. It won't solve some of the big anonymity questions that are still open research questions, but there are a lot of improvements we'd like to make to make the crypto more secure and performance changes and so on. And we've been thinking about doing some sort of crowdfunding Kickstarter-like thing to make hidden services work better. Uh, we've got a funder who cares about understanding hidden services, but that's not the same as actually making them more secure. So uh, we'd love to chat with you after this uh, about how to make one of those Kickstarters actually work. Right. So um, if you have questions, we have a, some amount of time for questions. Um, and while you line up the microphone, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So if you have questions, please line up at the microphone so we can do this. This is, a, this is a picture of a man who was assassinated in San Francisco. His name is Harvey Milk. Anybody here ever hear of Harvey Milk? Great. Harvey Milk was basically the first out gay politician in, I think, the United States. He was a city council member in San Francisco. And this was during a huge fever pitch uproar where basically it was the battle between are people who are gay people or not. And what he said is, go home and tell your brothers, your mothers, your sisters, your family members, and your coworkers that you're gay. Tell them that so that when they advocate for violence against gay people, when they advocate for harm against you, that they know they're talking about you. Not an abstract boogeyman, but someone that, that they, they actually know and that they love. We need every person in this room, every person watching this video later, to go home and talk about how you needed anonymity for five or 10 minutes, how you needed it every day to do your job. We need people to reach out. Now, there's a sad story with Harvey Milk, which is that he and Mayor Moscone of San Francisco were actually killed by a very crazy person that was also in city government in the traditional American tradition of extreme gun violence. Um, he was shot and killed, and that person actually got away with it, the so-called Twinkie defense. So we're not trying to draw that parallel. Just to be clear, please don't shoot us and kill us. Um, not even funny, unfortunately. But um, to understand that we are really under threat, a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure. We get pressure from law enforcement investigation agencies to backdoor tour, and we tell them no. And that takes a lot of stress and dumps it on us. And we need support from a lot of people to tell them to back off. It can't just be us that say that, or we will lose someday. And there are also very scary adversaries that do not care at all about the law. Not that those guys care about the law, but really don't care about the law at all. And we need people to understand how important anonymity is and to make sure that that goes into every conversation. So really go home and teach your friends and your family members about your need for anonymity. This lesson from Harvey Milk was very useful. It is the case that now in California, where there was a huge fever pitch battle about this, that you can, for example, be gay and be a school teacher. That was one of the battles that Harvey Milk helped win. Right. So 
with that, I think that we have time for... Yeah, we have like 10 minutes left for questions. So thank you so much for the talk. It's really inspiring. Thank you for keeping up the work. Really, although you do this every year, it never gets old. And I think you, every year you give people the chance to leave the Congress with a feeling of hope and purpose. So thank you so much for everything you do and every minute you spend on this project. So we start with a question from the internet. We'd like to take a few questions from the internet all at once, if possible, so we can try to answer them as quickly as possible. Okay. All right. So the first one, uh, yesterday you said that SSH is broken, so what should we use to safely administrate our Tor relays? Ah, that's great. So first, first of all, next set of questions. So the next one is, uh, how much money would be needed to get independent from uh, government funding, and is that even desired? Ah, do you want me to do both? Sure, okay. I'll fill it. Yep. Okay, first question. Consider using a Tor hidden service and then SSHing into that Tor hidden service. Composition of cryptographic components is probably very important. And detail about SSH. We don't know what is going on. We only know what was claimed in those documents. That's a really scary claim. This creates a political problem. The US Congress and other political bodies should really be asking the secret services if they really have a database called Caprios where they store SSH decrypts and how they populate that database because that is critical infrastructure. We can't solve that problem with the knowledge that we have right now, but we know now there is a problem. What is that problem? So composition of those systems, it seems to be the documents say that they haven't broken the crypto and Tor hidden services. So put those two together. Um, and also consider that cryptography only buys you time. It really isn't the case that all the crypto we have today is going to be good, maybe in 150 years. If sci-fi quantum computers ever come out and they actually work, Shor's algorithm and other things really seem to suggest we have a lot of trouble ahead. Um, and the second part's about money. Yeah, we would love to replace government funding. I mean, at least I would. But that isn't to say that we don't respect that there are people that do fund us to do good things. We do take money from agencies who, for example, the Department of Human Rights of Labor and Labor at the State Department, they're sort of like the advertising arm for the gun running part of the State Department, as Julian Assange would say. And they actually care about human rights. They care that you have access to anonymity. It's weird because the State Department, the rest of it, might not care. But we really, really would like to offset that money, but we'd like to grow. We'd like to be able to hire 100 people in this room to work on this full time because the planet needs anonymity. But that requires that we find that money. And the best place at the moment is by writing grant proposals. And that is how we have, in fact, done that. And that allows us also to operate openly. So we don't have, for example, clearances. And we try to publish everything we can about it. And if you ever write a FOIA, we always tell the agency that has received the Freedom of Information re request, give the requester everything. Give it all to them. We have nothing to hide about this. We want you to see that. We want you to see that when a government agency has paid us money, that we have done it for this line item and this line item, and we've done it as well as we could do it, and it is in line with the open research, and we have really done a good thing that helps people. Um, so I'd love to diversify our funding. I'd love to have foundations. Uh, I'd love to have the EFF model where individuals fund uh, uh, because we do great things, look at what we did over the past year, uh, and in fact, right here, look at we, what we did over the past year. We've done some amazing things, we're going to do some more amazing things next year. We need your help to actually make all of this happen. Anybody here a Bitcoin millionaire? Because we now take Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, let's take a question from Mike from one. Uh, just a short question. Is there uh, a follow-up on the Thomas White uh, uh, Tor Talk mailing list thing? So Thomas White runs a few exit relays. Some of them are quite large. I'm very happy he does that. It is quite normal for exit relays to come and go. He is in England, and as far as I can tell, England is in a is not a very good place to be these days. Uh, but he's trying to fix his country from inside, which is really great. Um, basically, the short version is it's not a big deal. He runs some exit relays. Somebody tries to take them down. There are 6,000 relays in the network right now. They go up and down. It's normal. Um, 
this is related to the Tor blog post, the Thomas White uh, thing, where you said there is an upcoming. Uh, it is unrelated, mail. except for the fact that everybody was watching. So then, when he wrote a Tor talk mail saying, "Hey, I'm concerned about my exit relays," suddenly all the journalists said, "Oh my God, they must be the same thing." So no, unrelated. There are a lot of people that have been attacking the Tor network. You've probably seen there have been denial of service attacks and things like that on the Tor directory authorities. This is what I was saying one or two slides ago when I said, please tell people the value of Tor and that you need it. Because when people do denial of service attacks, when they see servers, we really need, in a peer-to-peer -peer network way, to throw up more relays to actually increase the bandwidth capacity, to increase the exit capacity. And it's very important to do that. Right? I mean, it's very, very serious that those things happen, but it's also important that the design of the network is designed with the expectation that thieves will steal computer systems, that jerks will denial of service them, and so on. Um, so if you can run an exit relay, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Next question. Yeah, let's take a question from the microphone, too. Uh, first of all, a quick shout out to your uni friend. Please don't ask people to run arbitrary code over the internet. Curl pipe as age is not good style. Um, There's a deb that we're working on also that should be a lot better. Yeah, app get install uniprobe will also yes, work. Um, do you have any plans of implementing IP version 6 finally? Ah, so there is IPv. So Linus Nordberg, uh, one of the, the finest Tor people I've ever met, he in fact helped add IPv6 support. Uh, initial IPv6 support, uh, support to the Tor network. So for example, you can in fact exit through the Tor network with IPv4 or IPv6. Um, it is the case that the Tor relays in the network still all need IPv4, not just IPv6. Uh, my Tor directory authority, which runs in California, it has an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. So if you have an IPv6 address, you can bootstrap, you can connect to that. Um, you could do some interesting pluggable transport stuff as well. Um, so that is on the roadmap. This is another example of, if you really care about that issue, please send us your Bitcoins. And it would be really fantastic. <laughs> Because we really want that. But right now, you can use Tor as a V4, V6 gateway. Yeah. You really can do that, and we, re we would encourage that. It's another example of some kind of neat feature of Tor, which you would never think an anonymity system would have. And in Iran right now, where IPv6 is not censored because the, soft, the censorship stuff they have from America and Europe didn't think to censor IPv6. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. So you can use a bridge right Five now in Iran that connects over IPv6. Works great. Yeah. Next question. All right, microphone four. Great. So we heard uh, lots of really encouraging success stories about Tor uh, working against a global passive uh, adversary, but we know that Tor wasn't designed for this use case. Uh, the question is, what needs to happen uh, in order for Tor to actually be able to, to handle this officially? Um, and is this just research or, or some more development work? There's a lot of really hard open research questions there. So if you're, so I get, basically one of the issues is what we call the end-to-end -end traffic correlation attack. So if you can see the flow over here coming into the Tor network, and you can see the corresponding flow over here coming out of it, then you do some simple statistics and you say, hey, wait a minute, these line up. And there are a bunch of different directions on how to make that harder. Uh, basically, what you want to do is drive up the false positive rate. So you see a flow here, and there are actually a thousand flows that look like they sort of match. And maybe you can do that by adding a little bit of padding or delays or batching or something. Uh, the research, as we understand it right now, means that you have to add hours of delay, not seconds of delay. That's kind of crummy. So another way of phrasing that, uh, imagine a graph. The x-axis is uh, how much overhead we're adding, and the y-axis is how much security we get against the end-to-end -end correlation attack. We have zero data points on that graph. We have no idea what the curve looks like. There's also another point, which is Roger has an assumption. He says if we have a high false positive rate, that that's a good thing. Well, maybe. Maybe actually that's exactly the wrong thing. Maybe the result is that a thousand people get rounded up instead of one. The reality is that there is no system that, as far as we know, is actually safer than that. Of course, we would say that we work on Tor, but as an example, one of the X-Keyscore things that I've seen in this research, which we published in the NDR story, is that they were doing an attack on Hotspot Shield, where they were actually doing traffic correlation, where they were able to de-anonymize 
VPN users because it was a single hop. And then they were also able to do quantum insert to attack specific users using the VPN. We haven't seen evidence of them doing that to Tor. That, doesn't al that also doesn't mean that every VPN is broken, it just means that VPN has a different threat model. There's lots of attacks that are like that, and the problem is the internet is a dangerous place. So, I mean, Banksy said it best. He said, in the future, people will be anonymous for 15 minutes. And I think he may have overestimated that, depending on the attacker. There's a conference called the Privacy Enhancing Technologies Symposium, petsymposium.org, where all of the anonymous communications researchers get together each year to consider exactly these sorts of research questions. So it's not just an engineering question. There's a lot of basic science left in terms of how to make these things harder. All right, two last questions, one from the internet. Okay, so does running a uni probe um, involve any legal risks? Okay, so great, we can take different questions because we're going to say talk to Arturo. All right, so microphone three. Okay, um, as a new Tor relay operator, I've got, yeah. Take a bow. So, um, I, since about two months, I run three relays, uh, rather high bandwidth. And on two of these, I had, um, well, quite strange things happen. One case, um, a kernel crash in the Intel E1000 driver. The other one having the top of the rack switch just reboot, which is, by the way, a Uniper switch. So um, I'm kind of concerned about this operational security. Uh, you know, could you address that? Yeah, absolutely. So the short version of it is, Agencies like the NSA, depending on where you're located, might compromise something like your Juniper switch upstream. They sit on zero days for critical infrastructure. That includes core routers um, and switches. But it may not be such a big thing. It really depends on where you're located. It could also be that the hardware sucks <laughs> and that the software is not good. And when you, of course, are pushing, let's say, gigabits of traffic through it, it falls over. It's really hard to know. Um, that's a really good question, which is very specific and kind of hard for us to address without data. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm concerned that um, the uh, like attack like this, you know, they could actually compromise the machine without knowing or compromise the exact uplink, mm -hmm. and this would actually be a viable attack, like very low key. You don't see it as an operator, maybe if you're not very careful, and you can watch all the traffic going inside, going outside the box. You know, it would be fantastic if you can prove that theory, because of course if you can, maybe we can find other information that allows us to stop those types of things to happen, or for example, can in some way allow us to fix the problems that are, to be, that are being exploited. The reality is that general purpose computers are quite frankly not very secure, and special purpose computers aren't doing much better. I worry not only about active attacks like that, but about passive attacks where they already have some sort of surveillance device upstream from you in your co-location facility or something like that. So yes, these are all uh, really big concerns. One of the defenses that Tor has is diversity around the world, so hopefully they won't be able to do that to all of the relays. Uh, but yeah, this is a big issue. We should keep talking about it. All right, I just want to come back to the, to, the second, to the question before for a second because there was a question from the internet so the people are not able to talk. Unicode guy, hey, could you, Uni, Uniprobe, uh, could you maybe answer the question like right now or maybe on Twitter or post a link or something because I happen to believe that it's a very important question. You remember the question? If there so, are yeah, legal risks. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that we, we don't really know um, like what are the, who was it that was asking the question? The internet. Ah, the internet, okay. <laughs> there you go. I, so, so, so um, I guess we, we can't know all of the legal risks involved with, uh, in every country. Uh, it, it is definitely the case that uh, in some countries you may get in trouble for uh, visiting some uh, websites that are considered uh, illegal. Um, so what, what um, I, I, can, I can go in more detail into this uh, if you come later to Noisy Square at 6. Uh, Ah, the internet can come, shit. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, there are a lot of jerks in that. The, 
the, the, the short answer is that you should look at the test specifications that are written in English and they uh, have at the bottom some notes that uh, detail what can be some of the risks involved. Uh, but we, we are not lawyers, so we, we don't uh, uh, know what, what are the risks for all of the countries. So uh, you should probably speak to somebody that uh, uh, knows about these things in your country. And it's experimental software and, you know, there are not many people that are doing this, so we, we generally can't, can't say. Hope that answers your question. Thanks a lot, yeah, thanks. All right, I guess just to sum it up, be careful whatever you do. Um, all right, so uh, Jake was just asking if maybe we could just um, gather a couple of questions and then ask about them outside. Did I get that right? Yeah, so if yep. everyone who's at the microphone dispersed to the correct microphone, if you could just ask all your questions, then everyone else who's here that wants to hear the answers will know that you should stick around and talk to us afterwards. We won't answer all these questions unless there's a really burning one, but that way the guys that are standing at the microphone or the gals that are standing at the microphone or other can actually ask them right now. And if you're interested, come and find us right afterwards. We're going to probably go to the tea house upstairs, so I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> Don't all right, all so, so we're going to do it like this. We're going to rush through this. So you're just going to hear a lot of interesting questions, but no answers. If you want to hear the answers, uh, stay tuned and don't switch the channel. So we take a couple of questions. Microphone five, and be quick about it. In regards, in regards to robustness and the Mozilla partnership, are there any thoughts about incrementally replacing the C++ infrastructure with Rust eventually? Right. Microphone four. Is it open? Microphone four. Can you compare um, Tora with uh, JAP from TU Dresden in uh, aspects of enormity? Okay, the other guy at microphone four. Uh, to your knowledge, has anyone got into trouble for running a non-exit relay? And do you have any tips for people that want to help by running a non-exit relay? Okay, microphone one, two guys. I have a question or other sh uh, suggestion for, for the funding problematic. Have you, you're teaming up with Mozilla. Have you ever um, considered like producing your own smartphones because there is a huge margin? I also think there is a problem like why most people don't use encrypt or cryptographics, uh, cryptography is because um, it's there's no like easy to use out of the box cool product that's like that goes out that has a story or anything like marketing or Apple. All right, the other guy at microphone one. So a uh, couple of minutes before the talk started, um, someone did a civil attack on Tor, and we should fix that ASAP. So please don't disappear for the next few hours. Thanks. All right. Ah! <laughs> it never ends. It never ends. <laughs> All right. Um, the two questions from Micron 3. So when they took down Silk Road, they uh, took a lot of um, Bitcoins with them. I wonder what the government is doing with the large amount of anonymized cash. They um, auction it off. They sell it. Next oh, question. And I think they should give it to you. All right, last question. We agree. <laughs> so to combat against the uh, misinformed journalist thing, why not have a dashboard very prominently displayed on the Tor project listing all of the academic open like known problems with Tor and always have the journalists go there first to get the source of information rather than misunderstanding academic research. Fantastic. So if All right, you want to know. Yeah, if you found any of these questions interesting and you're also interested in the answers, stick around, go to Noisy Square, speak to these two guys and get all your answers. Other than that, you heard it a brilliant times, but go home, start a relay. My friends and I did two years ago after Jake's keynote. It's really not that hard. You can make a difference. And thank you so much for Roger and Jake as every Thanks. year.